wind stung Samson's cheeks and blurred his vision as he guided his horse's bridle farther into the snowy wastes that laid about him. His steed moved sluggishly under sacks that hung at its side. Its owner was in far worse shape as well. He shivered under layers unfit for the elements, his figure of motley blues and greys plodding along, leaving nothing but tracks and gaining nothing but time. In the far distance, a dark mist wall closed in. Everything it touches cracks and rumbles to ashes, a mass of darkness consuming town after town as it envelops what little landscape remains. Initially, the darkness had been little more than a myth, some far-off problem in a far-off land that would never touch the lives of the common man. Myth was made real as months dragged on. Samson was a painter, considered to be highly proficient despite his minimal training, and so he made his living by traveling the countryside as a freelance artist. This was just work for him, however. It bought the resources that tied body and soul together. In all honesty, these creations left him joyless. He felt uninspired and hard-pressed for new ideas. It was unremarkable, however, because many of the creatures these days were devoid of the fires of creativity and emotion that living breathes so effortly, effortlessly into us. The hollowness of the future echoes across this world, from the voices of farmhands to the stillness between trees and the forest. As the hill's inclination grew and he began to hike up yet another mountain of snow, his desire to give up and lay down was mounting. And after a long while in the cold, Samson reached the pinnacle of the snowy hill and looked down at sprawling greenery. Within his supplies, snake oil and egg clinked together with each of the horse's strides. Samson was motivated largely by his own survival and desire to improve his art. He remembered often how knights spoke of valor and honor, and how that drove him towards goals. No such feeling was spared to Samson. At the top of the mountain, he quickly assembled his easel and canvas before trying to capture the rolling hills of pastoral pleasure. Plumes of smoke spiraled out of cottage chimneys and humble homes in lazy pillars reaching for the heavens. His painting began well and captured the essence of what he saw. But just as his heart began to warm at this breakthrough, he took a step back and realized it was all wrong. The proportions of the homes were skewed, the color was incorrect. A frown spread across Samson's face as he finished the painting. While it was a beautiful inaccuracy, it failed miserably to capture the coziness of the lifestyle he saw. In trying to generate feelings of, rea of relaxation, his hand could only produce terror and awe. After resigning himself to his latest floundering mess, he made his way down to the pastures of a small town called Greengrove. The people here laughed and drank in the streets to such excess that the frozen wanderer could not help but feel confused. They obviously knew of their demise, but reveled more than ever. Passing naked dancers in the street, Samson approached a fruit stand in the center of the market that was full of rotten food. All farming and craftsmanship had ceased. No one here cared about the painter's art. Nobody carried the money to commission anything. And despite the clawing of an empty stomach, Samson was glad to not be heralded as some artistic genius. The fruits of undeserved recognition are far more rotten than any spoiled in the brazen hedonism these townsfolk displayed. That night, he lay with a girl a few years older than him. Neither exchanged names as they didn't need to know each other. Cool air swept down from the mountains and left them shivering and shaking like two husks desperately clinging to one another for warmth and stability. She was beautiful, with long black hair and a short nose that pointed up slightly. Her day of wild dancing and smiles contrasted with the sobering melancholy that enveloped her while she lay on Samson's arm. He thought back to when he met her and how he painted her portrait for free. He pored over his work, desperately trying to impress her with a flawless portrait, only to be laughed at. Stop trying so hard to catch me. You'll never be an artist if you try to steal your subject. 
Samson had never been met with this sort of rejection before, having only been told how amazing his abilities were. Despite her disinterest with his illusory abilities, she stayed all the same. Samson felt glimmers of new emotion surface when he was with her, and huddled close, not wanting their time to end. It felt strange to grow attached to this girl so quickly, in a life populated with oddities. Ever since ruination began to splinter and shatter the world, people had been stranger than ever before. Samson's mind wandered back to a fool he had met a few months ago. The fool sat on an altar and prayed to some unknown god that by sacrificing himself, the darkness would be sated. Samson was never one for religion and had never found solace in piety. The man claimed that his willing death would bring about an age of prosperity and protection. He spoke in riddles and babbled about half-fulfilled prophecies. His speech matched his appearance, a ragged and scarred body adorned with loose garments. His sun-baked skin contrasted with the murky whites of his eyes encrusted in his head. The fool's gaze was fixed to the inexorable tide in the horizon as if his sight had rusted and corroded unto his fate. The fool was archaic, and every edge of his face crinkled as it contorted to allow him to speak. He looked starved, his skin was unevenly tight in some places, while other sections of flesh were peeling from welts. His slow-moving nature created an illusion that he was almost a statue. The altar itself was covered in arcane glyphs, and sported reddish stains and shards of bone. This raised circular platform looked more like a sacrificial table than a relig religious artifact. Together, they looked like a monastic idol resting on a pedestal. Tied to a post next to the pedestal was a sturdy looking horse. It towered in comparison to the fool. Would you like to make a deal? I would love to have a portrait, and I've a horse for trade. The fool's voice was low and crinkled, as if his lungs lacked the strength to constrict properly. Samson himself was without a horse at this time, and was very tired from walking. I can paint you a beautiful painting, and I would be happy to have a horse. After an afternoon of work, Samson's hands conjured a painting of the fool that made him seem strong and balanced. His joints seemed corded with muscle that gave him an aura of defiance. It is an equal trade, to be sure, the horse affirmed, watching unbothered as the painter reached to shake hands with the fool. Samson's gaze was returned by eyes like twinkling silver coins in the recesses of the man's skull. These memories haunted him, in a half-jumbled array. The aftertaste of wine lingered in his mouth while he breathed in the smell of wood smoke from the girl's hair. Her words about his theft of subject tumbled through his brain as if puncturing and splintering gray matter in every direction as he contemplated. He could feel the traitorous sands of time slowly entombing him while he conjured cheap tricks. To shatter his tomb, he would need a tool of legacy rather than fantasy. Perhaps he needed to create something that cultivated reality rather than coins. It became difficult to fixate on any one sense as he drifted into the twilight of his consciousness. By the morning, the girl was gone as lazy mornings are inappropriate during the, t during the apocalypse. As Samson scanned the horizon, he saw the tide of darkness in the distance. It ripped trees from the ground and the landscape cracked and fractured under its rain. The fool would have been consumed by darkness long since. After gathering some supplies, Samson set off once again with the emptiness to his back. His goals were nebulous, even to himself. His body forced him to elude death, but his mind was looking for a prize far more precious. He craved the nourishment that can be felt from a drink of water after a day's labor or from ver viewing the first signs of spring after a harsh winter. Later that day, his horse stopped walking. Why have you stopped? Samson inquired. I am tired of running away. The horse looked back to the storm that served as its constant companion. 
You'd rather die than walk. Samson could not believe what he was hearing. His horse had always cultivated an aura of stoic pragmatism. I am sick of pointless wandering. It is time to give up and rest, quoth the horse. Wordlessly, the painter removed his packs and slung them over his shoulder before continuing on. The horse solemnly looked out towards its rumbling doom. As Samson walked away from the darkness, he longed for his dark-haired girl and considered her words carefully. How could you teach a man to be an artist? A scrawny painter could not lift a sword or wear a suit of armor, but eventually anyone could grow strong enough to be a hero. How could you learn to let authentic emotions flow from heart to hand to canvas? Three days later, Samson came across a stone fortress with spiraling towers and high walls. He entered through the front gate with a few other travelers and found a corner within the fort to offer his services as a painter. The people here laughed too hard and spoke too loudly. Their smiles never met their eyes, eyes that were full of quiet, simmering fear. The plot near his eyes was where the builders toiled over laying down a new foundation. All day, Samson painted portraits and landscapes for the people in the castle and was handsomely rewarded. They showered him with praise for his use of color and framing. He would employ methods such as negative space when he became frustrated with the monotony and his patrons loved every work he produced. Once landscapes became mundane as well, Samson would incorporate natural elements to add texture to his art. It was like anything anyone else had ever seen. These creative ideas fused the material world into art. For Samson, this was infuriating. He had done all these tricks before and felt more like a con artist than a painter. With every work, he would scour his mind for a piece he'd done years prior and simply recycle the elements that were effective. Where others saw sprawling beauty and a perfect connection between the ideal form of an image and its manifestation on the page, Samson saw a machine toiling away with a distinctly cold and calculated methodology. Every compliment served as a reminder of the abilities he did not possess. At the peak of his frustration, a noble approached him and offered to be his sponsor. Sponsorship was a great way to build capital and renown. However, it would entail constant creation at the whim of some lordling. The painting that inspired the lord was of the girl from Greengrove. He had used snake oil to capture the hue of her hair. Samson refused, only for the lord to yell and berate him for being too snobbish. Who was he to turn his nose up at such a generous offer? The whole point of art is to function in, a, in an industry. People didn't like to hear it, but it was true. The art world was a forever hungry lion that craved disillusioned dreamers. For Samson, every painting was self-slaughter. He would slay the lamb, sustaining his body, while seeking in vain to nourish his soul. No work of art was anything short of suicide. This was heightened when an artist was chained to someone else's purse strings. Samson had been sponsored before, and often felt like a caged bird rather than a painter, while under a noble's employ. The man drove Samson out of the keep with a few other disgruntled townsfolk, clearly displeased at, a, at being denied a request. Scraped and bruised, the painter walked to the top of a nearby hill that overlooked the keep and began to set up camp. That night, the darkness was particularly dreadful swallowing up more terrain and generating a terrible noise. Like grinding rocks, it rumbled and churned on the horizon as it turned towards the keep. The next day, Samson skipped gold coins across a pond while he ruminated on his previous day's work. By the time he had emptied his previously burgeoning purse, he turned and began to paint the keep. He tried to cull the majesty of the structure to frolic on the white prison of his art, his hand wove back and forth, singing to his subject in a wild attempt to bind the beauty of the image to his abilities, but he simply could not capture it. It looked sinister upon completion, like a cursed castle holding a ruined king, boiling frustration welled up in Samson. He simply could not generate the right feeling. All he could think of was vapid nobles telling him he was the master at translating emotion into image. With a sigh, he packed up his collection of mistakes and walked away from the darkness. He wandered the world for a month, 
pointlessly painting in a slow death by landscape. His roaming yielded few notable interactions. Towns were deserted, people wandered aimlessly, and the future weighed heavily on the people he met. Eventually, Samson came across a troll sitting on a bridge. The troll was hunched over, with flecks of green splashed over his shoulders, neck and back. The monster could have passed for a bulger that nature had reclaimed with flora. Samson only recognized it was alive when the mound of alabaster skin heaved a deep sigh. Waves of fear rushed over Samson, but his curiosity could not be quelled. He made his way to the beast. The troll's voice was like a grinding of rocks, its force sweeping through the trees and swaying the pines with its gentle, bristling breeze. I would like a painting, but I have no mammoth for you, the troll rumbled. Samson took out his tools and began to portray the troll's likeness. They spoke about the darkness. The troll described the pointlessness of living. He'd stopped guarding his bridge and eating travelers a long time ago. Now, he simply sat and pondered the purpose of being a troll. If the darkness will destroy all trolls, then what good is it to eat, he mused. Samson thought long and hard about this. He was pleased to not be eaten by the beast, but felt these words ring true for himself as well. They sat together and spoke for so long that eventually they could hear the darkness approaching from all angles. This meadow was the last bastion of life. Samson could feel the darkness closing on his heart, but all he wanted was to finish this painting properly. The low rumbling of the troll's voice washed all fears from the painter while he freed himself. Samson felt his body crumble into sand until he was merely hand and brush enraptured in the forging of his legacy. With the final brushstrokes, the spilt sands recollected and rebuilt Samson into an artist. When he looked up from his canvas, the quaking had stopped, the troll was gone, and the meadow was beautiful and full. The painting was also devoid of its subject, perfectly enrapturing the setting that splayed out before him. Months pass, and Samson stood over a rocky wasteland painting a beautiful winter landscape. When myth was made real, there was nothing to do but smile and shield his eyes from the sun's reflection from the fresh snow.